Hey guys, we are back with updates in the wild circus of a trial with Lori Vallow. We now have gone into week three of the trial, so I'm coming on here to give you a full recap of everything that went down this week because there was even more crazy audio played, horrific, horrific details about the children that were shared, and so much information. So if you haven't been following along with the trial because you don't have, 40 plus hours to sit around and watch trial footage or listen to the trial audio, I should say. Totally get it, not a problem. I'm coming on here every single week, giving you a quick condensed recap of all of the main takeaways, the key highlights, any revelations, so you can be fully up to speed as we go through the trial week to week. So if you haven't caught up yet, I have my previous recaps on this playlist on my page. You can watch those, but here's the week three recap as we get ready to head into week four. Hey guys, my name is Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. This is 10 to Life with Annie Elise. Detective Stubbs continued his testimony from last Thursday. He said that following the discovery of the children's bodies buried at Chad's house, another warrant was issued, this time to gather specific readings of the property in relation to cell phone pings. This warrant was executed in collaboration with the FBI, and it retrieved geological data from cell phones containing hundreds of thousands of records. To identify additional devices that were moving or in common with the locations on the key dates believed to be linked with the murders, officers asked Google for devices within a specific radius around Chad's property and Lori's apartment. They asked Google for any devices that would be within those circular fences. Specifically, they were looking at those locations on September 8th and 9th, and September 22nd and 23rd, when it's believed that Tylee and JJ were killed and later buried. The search showed that only one device had commonalities during the specific days in question, which belonged to Alex Cox. Detective Stubbs continued on saying that Google responded to the warrants with serial numbers and data, not personal information and names. In total, Lori, Chad, and Alex had a total of 18 burner phones that they used for several months, even going back to before Charles was killed. Some of their email addresses were connected to these burner phones as well. There was Homer J. Maximus' account linked to Alex, and police were able to find his search history and other data tied to his account. The Lori for style at iCloud.com and LollyTimeForever at gmail.com were both linked to Lori. A Gmail account belonging to Chad was also searched. In Chad's search history on September 8th, he looked up what the wind direction was going to be for the next day. September 9th is the day that Chad said that he was going to burn limbs and killed a raccoon in his yard and sent that long text message to Tammy that was completely out of character based on all of their previous text communications. And the Lolly Time email account on August 25th, 2019 looked for malachite wedding rings and wedding rings made of malachite and then ordered an 11 and a half size ring and a 4.25 size malachite ring. The total amount was around $808. Now this caught Detective Stubbs' attention because Charles had died in July and Chad was still married to Tammy at the time. He said, and I quote, we were thinking it was odd for her to be looking at wedding rings at that time. On September 30th, 2019, the account searched for possessed and how to remove the rear seat of my Jeep Wrangler. Then the account watched a YouTube video about how to remove the seat from the Jeep. This was days before Brandon Boudreaux was shot at by someone in the Jeep. In October, the account looked for wedding dresses in Kauai. Detective Stubbs also indicated that this was being looked at on the same day as Tammy's funeral. 
literally zero remorse or acknowledgement of like real life as it stands. Also, on one of Lori's email accounts, they brought in the horrific and infamous Hawaii wedding photos, and they showed Chad and Lori hugging, Chad and Lori in a dance pose, the close-up of the malachite rings, Chad and Lori gazing into each other's eyes, and Chad playing the ukulele while Lori does this Hawaiian dance. The last picture showed Chad holding Lori in his arms while they kiss and the ocean is in the background. The jury was paying extremely close attention during all of this. The next witness called was Nicole Heidman, and she works for the FBI. She was asked to review some of the Google searches on Chad's Gmail account and the Lolly Time account. She went through Chad's chaddaybell.com Gmail account and went through the dates from October 1st, 2018 through November 28th, 2019. On January 31st, 2019, Ned Schneider, Louisiana Obituary, 1997. Which I have to just say that's really weird because that's also the alias that um, Lori pinned on Charles as being possessed, if you remember correctly. On March 3rd, 2019, a search, June 26, star sign, are Cancer and Leo compatible? May 4th sign, Taurus and Leo compatible. Now, Taurus was Tammy's sign, and Cancer is Lori's, and Leo is Chad's. So he's, like, Googling if he's compatible with his wife or if he's compatible with his mistress and all of these things. On March 5th, 2019, Malachite, eBay, Malachite Jewelry. On June 1st, 2019, Hiplos. On July 9th, 2019, when you surprise someone with accusations. This was two days before Charles was killed. On September 8th, 2019, SSW Wind. What is the definition of SSW Wind? On October 8th, 2019, Rhode Island Area Code. Now, this will come in later, but one of the burner phones, Area Code, was a Rhode Island Area Code. So next, she went through Lori's account activity on the Lolly Time Forever Gmail account from March 7th, 2019 through December 14th, 2019. On September 30th, 2019, how to get the back seat out of my Jeep Wrangler, Jeep Wrangler JK rear seat removal, how to DIY on YouTube. On October 2nd, 2019, Gilbert, Arizona News. On October 22nd, 2019, wedding dresses, wedding dresses in Hawaii. Agent Heidman said investigators determined Chad had nine phone numbers between October 2018 and January 2020. There were three numbers of interest. Lori had six phone numbers. Three were of interest. Alex Cox had six phone numbers, and three were of interest as well. Two documents were found in the Lori for Style at iCloud.com account. One was titled Seven Archangels, and the second was Presiding Council of Archangels. In the first document, there was discussion of Malachite, Raphael, and James. Tuesday was mentioned. Chad and Lori were married on a Tuesday. In the second document, the names Elena and Lily were mentioned. The color green and Tuesday was mentioned. Now, Malachite is a green stone, and Lori and Chad were married on a Tuesday. Chad and Lori conducted Google searches for Malachite in May of 2019, according to Heidman's review of their search history. On August 14th of 2019, Lori tried to purchase two glow-in-the-dark Malachite rings from Etsy. Lori tried to order two more rings on August 25th and have them shipped to Rexburg, but her credit card was declined. So just when we thought that she was looking up wedding rings 17 days before Tammy died, when she did that order on Amazon, it was actually much worse than we all thought. This goes back all the way to May, before Charles, Tylee, JJ, and Tammy were killed. On July 22nd, 2019, Chad and Lori texted each other regarding Kauai and the plan. Chad texted Lori, love you, and said he was going to see the other side of heaven, too, and he was going to go with his son. Lori responds to this, saying, I love you. Chad responds, not as much as I love you. Then Lori responds that Chad will love the scenery in the movie because it's similar to Hawaii. Chad responds, hopefully we can be there soon. Next, Nick Balance, a special agent with the FBI out of Salt Lake City office, was called to the stand. He said that on September 9, 2019, between 12 and 5 a.m., three locations linked to the account were repeated northwest of Lori's Rexburg apartment. Between August 1st and August 31st, the Homer J. Maximus account registered at Lori's apartment a handful of times. 
On the morning of September 9th, there was a lot of communication on devices linked to Chad and Alex. There was also text communication between Chad and Lori from 8.15 a.m. to 9.06 a.m. on September 9th. Between 11.42 and 11.47 a.m. on September 9th, the Homer J. Maximus account was in the vicinity of Chad's home. Next, he talked about the cell phone activity on September 23rd between 3.59 a.m. and 8.34 a.m. Chad had sent numerous text messages to Lori. Now, if you remember, this is the time that it's suspected that JJ was killed, sometime between the 22nd and the 23rd, and that same weekend that Melanie Gibb and David Warwick were staying at Lori's condo in Rexburg. Remember how David had that weird nightmare, and Melanie was wanting to see if Chad could give them a blessing, but Lori had her door locked. That was all during all of this. Cell phone records showed Chad made a call to Alex on September 23rd at 9.25 a.m. Chad also called Lori three times between 9.30 and 9.35 a.m. on the same date. The account registered to Homer J. Maximus was on Chad's property from 9.55 a.m. to 10.12 a.m. on September 23rd. It was tracked near a small pond on Chad's property in the center of the property and in close proximity to where JJ was located. The phone linked to Alex was on Chad's property at 10.12 a.m., but eight minutes later, the phone left the property. Then Alex had a nine-minute phone call with Lori during that time frame. Then Special Agent Balance talked about the cell phone pings around Tammy's death. Tammy died on October 19, 2019. On October 9th, Chad sent a text message at 9.57 a.m. to Lori. Gonna stop by the store right now to get that other number working. Hopefully it won't take long. He sent a second message at 10.26 a.m. I will call right now from a 401 number. On October 18th, 2019, the day before Tammy died, Alex's cell phone was at his Rexburg apartment. Between 1.56 p.m. and 8.54 p.m., text messages were exchanged between Chad, Lori, and Alex. There was also a call that lasted over 49 minutes between Chad and Lori. One of Alex's phones pinged, and it was at a location at a church near Chad's house around 10.07 p.m. on October 18th, and this was according to the FBI agent. And what do you know? Chad told investigators that Tammy died in her sleep early on October 19th. On the night of the 18th, three text messages were sent to Lori from Alex, one at 11.34 p.m. and two at 11.35 p.m. Alex's phone traveled south from the area of Chad's home around 11.54 p.m. At 12.09 a.m., the phone was completely out of the area. And poof, what do you know it? Magically, coincidentally, Tammy is also deceased. Now, from our court insider, because if you've been following these recaps, I've let you know we have an insider who is in the courtroom watching all of this go down in person and has been texting us updates. So our court insider says this. Lori had her hand on her head and was staring at the screen showing the evidence at her table. The jury seemed to have perked up and listened intently, taking notes constantly while evidence information comes in continuously throughout the whole morning. Then Summer Shiflett, Lori's younger sister, was called to the stand. Summer said she played an active role throughout Tylee and JJ's lives. She first learned that they were missing in December of 2019 from media. Summer was not in contact with Lori at the time and did not know where she was. Summer said she spoke to Lori in February of 2020 about where the kids were, and she said, I don't remember the exact wording, but she basically told me that she knew where they were and that they were safe. Summer said she believed Lori and thought that the kids were okay. When she learned the truth, she felt lied to, and her trust in Lori was completely broken. Then the prosecution played a jail phone call between Lori and Summer that took place two weeks after JJ and Tylee were found on Chad's property. From our court insider, she said that Summer was extremely emotional throughout her testimony and during the phone call being played. Both Lori and Summer were looking down. While the call was played, it was very tense throughout the courtroom and many people were crying, including several jurors. Summer apparently wouldn't look at Lori after the call. This call is absolutely haunting to hear. You can hear the pain in Summer's voice, the desperation, the anger, the fear. When you're listening to it, 
I don't know about you, for me, I had a pit in my stomach the entire time. I don't know if it's because I was thinking of my own children, because of my closeness and my close relationship with my sister, but you can just hear in Summer's voice the anger and just heartbreak that she was experiencing and trying to plead with Lori. What do you mean you don't know? Like, tell me the truth. What happened? How could you do that to your kids? It is just truly a haunting call to listen to. Not good. How are you? Not good. I don't know what to say. Do you not want to talk? I'm willing to listen if you want to talk to me. I just don't know what to say.
before you left and cut me off. And now you expect me to be there for you and you were going to abandon me. And if you weren't in jail, you wouldn't even be talking to me and we wouldn't even know they were dead still. This is your opinion. Yes. I deserve more than that. I've been there for you like a rock. And I have get, I went on TV and defended you. I've done everything to defend you. And I still would right now if you would tell me the truth. I would have loved to. Well, then. I would have loved to. You didn't want to in October, November, December, January, or February. When you weren't in jail. Why didn't you tell us then? Why, you didn't call me when Alex died, which now I'm glad he's gone. If he was a part of this, but you didn't call to tell me Alex died or that your kids are gone. Nothing. You don't think that's going to cause pain throughout our entire family? That's never my intent. Well, you don't think I'm in pain? No, I don't. I think you were dancing on the beach having a great time. Getting married. And you took pictures to prove your kids don't deserve a burial, but you need to get wedding pictures? You don't think that's upsetting? Nobody knows. I'm sorry, honey. <sighs> Then nobody knows except for you and the Lord. Yeah, ask him. I have. And guess what? I don't have one scripture that says it's okay for children to be thrown away like garbage in the ground. And that that's okay. There is nothing in the scriptures that is godly about hurting a child. Nothing. And they deserve a proper burial with family that loves them at the least. I can't support that. That's hurtful to everyone. That's the most selfish, incredibly selfish thing I can think of. I can't think of anything worse. I don't understand. I don't understand. This is not my Lolo that I've known and loved. I've never even seen you be upset with your kids. I went to bat for you and said that to everyone. I never have been upset with them. I never <laughs> have been. How can you just go on without them, without any upsetness, and without telling us anything, no, and then expect know. us to understand? No, no, in the world, nobody in the world knows what I've been through. And I don't expect you to. All you've seen is what's on TV. No, that's not what he says. And all the influences of all the people around. Okay, so now I'm deceived. No, Everyone I'm in the world that. is deceived except for you. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that. I'm saying nobody's seen me on the floor crying. Nobody knows what I've been through. But my children that I love more than anything. Lori, fine. You were dancing on a beach with a smile on your face, taking wedding photos. Yeah, months later. <laughs> you don't trying think? to go on with life, trying to be happy, trying to find some kind of happiness. You think I want to be alone? Do you think that your mother and your sister and your son don't deserve to know that the children are gone? Why wouldn't you call and tell us that? Why were we cut off? You saying you want to go on and be happy? You were just going to be happy without your family and your life until you're stuck in jail and I'm the only one stupid enough to be your friend? When I've been your best supporter, Lori, I've loved you my whole life. I still do. I can't bear to think of anything bad about you. It hurts me. I don't want to see you in jail. I don't want you to be there. I don't want people.
about this is okay for you. We have all read the scriptures. I know you've told me about a lot of your spiritual experiences. You know I'm trying to support you in all of them. But I am telling you, because I love you with all my heart, please consider that Chad has lied and been deceived and that you have been deceived and that this is not what you think it is. There is nothing okay about killing children. Nothing. And even if you didn't kill them and Chad didn't kill them and Alex didn't kill them, you threw them away like the garbage in the ground. You, Tyler's both are burned. You, I can't hear me going in that and threw her in a pet cemetery. You know that's so degrading. How can you let them do that? I don't understand. It's so painful. I can't even tell you. I don't know what I've been saying, but please consider that you have been deceived. That is not Christ like. There's nothing good in that. There's nothing good in that. That's not a test for you. You are innocent. And they were loved, and they didn't deserve to be treated that way. And who loved them their whole life and took care of them their whole life? So why would you not be buried that me. way? I didn't. Well, then come up with an explanation publicly. Steve Daniels, a special agent with the FBI, was called to the stand. He works on the FBI evidence response team. That team was asked to come help with a search strategy to execute a search warrant on June 9th and 10th, 2020 at Chad's property. He said that 500 to 700 photos were taken on Chad's property the day that they served the search warrant. He went through numerous photos showing how the scene was processed. They began in the fire pit area, and dirt was sifted with rakes and shovels, as well as sifters with mesh screens. Bone fragments, organic material, and pieces of cloth and fabric were collected from the fire pit. He said that the smell of human decomposition was overpowering in this area. A necklace chain was found inside the fire pit and also processed as evidence. A silver charm was also found near the fire pit. In front of a dog statue at the pet cemetery, there were some disturbed areas where human remains could be found. Hand tools were used before a backhoe and tractor were brought in to help dig. They found a large bone and Agent Daniel said, with the size of the bone being found, I could also smell an odor I could associate with human remains decomposing. So between this bone being found and a second bone being found, we knew there was something here, but we didn't know if it was a human or an animal yet. The next picture shown was a bunch of bricks in the dirt, which ended up being Tylee's gravesite. At the time, police were not aware that this is where she was buried, but the odor continually got stronger and stronger. The next photo was a close-up view of the pieces identified as Tylee. And he said, you can see the bigger bones sticking out of the ground. Her remains were melted together in the ground. The crews continued their search on June 10th. Blue tarps were placed on the ground, and a sifting operation was set up to find more possible remains in the ground. Next, the prosecution showed a photo of a mass of a human and melted, and a green bucket with part of a skull. Agent Daniel said it took a while for us as investigators to figure out what happened here. What is this? The team tried to lift the remains out of the ground, but they all fell apart. They were able to collect them and put them in a body bag, and afterwards, the anthropologist and coroner separated the remains so that an inventory could be done on what parts they had. They also searched Chad's shed. Pictures were shown of the shed and the entryway. Agent Daniel said, knowing that we are dealing with a burial, one of the things we are interested in is the tools. There were some tools hanging or leaning on the wall in the shed, including a pickaxe and several shovels that were seized as evidence. Some bricks found on the side of the shed were also seized. The bricks were similar to those found at Tylee's burial site. Other items, including bush clippers, some saws, and an axe, were seized also from the garage. Some bricks found on the side of the shed were also seized. The bricks were similar to those found at Tylee's burial site. Next, he talked about the discovery of JJ's gravesite. 
the prosecution showed a picture of three huge rocks underneath the dirt, and that pretty much screamed out that something is wrong. This shouldn't be here, and we need to look at this. From our court insider, during Agent Daniel's testimony on Tuesday, Lori kept looking down. Summer's husband was seen having a deadlock on Lori with a clenched jaw. Lori had her arms crossed and had a scowl-like expression on her face during the photo evidence of Chad's property. The jury was glued to their screens when being shown pictures of the property. Lori had her head down while Tylee's remains were being shown. Summer and her family were sobbing. Some members of the jury had tears in their eyes and one looked red in the face and was glaring at Lori. Lori lifted her head when property pictures were being shown, but her head went straight back down when remains were being shown of Tylee. Summer was shaking and sobbing the entire time that the pictures were going through. Summer and her family were also seen sobbing uncontrollably in the hallway after court when they were leaving for the day. Special Agent Daniels continued his testimony Wednesday morning. They brought up the photos of the rocks again of JJ's burial site, and he said that this was a good indication that this was a burial site due to the precise manner that the rocks were placed. Then pictures of the boards underneath the rocks, and Agent Daniels described how they were strategically placed, saying, I've probably excavated approximately five to seven burials. Out of all of those burials, this is the most precise. Somebody's taken the most effort to bury these remains. You would place planks and rocks to prevent wildlife from finding human remains. If they scattered the human remains, a neighbor or someone else could discover them so the grave isn't as hidden. Prosecutor Wood asked Agent Daniels to discuss the differences between JJ and Tylee's burial sites. He said that there was a big difference. JJ's remains were all intact, wrapped in plastic bags and very coordinated with rocks and wooden planks. Tylee's burial site was just a mass of organic material that fell apart when the team went to uncover it. Well, we all know that Chad is a grave digger. So does this mean that Chad was present whenever Tylee's remains were burned but didn't bury her, but then had direct involvement in burying JJ? We don't know. But to me, there seems to be a very stark difference, obviously, between the way the two of them were buried and killed. It's just horrific. I mean, some of these details, guys, are awful. What is the reason behind that? What is the reason to protect one set of remains in such a precise and strategic way, but not the other? Is it because Alex is the one who got rid of Tylee's remains, and then Chad came in, and he's the one who got rid of JJ's in a more expert manner, because he was, quite literally, an expert in grave digging? What do you think? The next witness was Dr. Garth Warren, the forensic pathologist that conducted the autopsies on Tylee and JJ. His testimony was extremely graphic and disturbing, so just a heads up, but I'm going to play a few clips of his testimony for you to hear. Based on that particular autopsy and based upon your education, training, and experience, have you formed an expert opinion concerning the cause of death of J.J. Ballow? I have. What was that? I determined the cause of death to be asphyxia by a plastic bag over the head, <laughs> and duct tape covering the mouth. And then there's another segment that's other significant conditions. Um, I put bound with duct tape, bruising of the arms, and abrasion to the neck. But ultimately the, the cause of death was asphyxia uh, by plastic bag over the head, the head and duct tape over the mouth. When you commenced your autopsy of J.J. Vallow. Can you describe for the jury uh, what you initially observed? So initially, uh, the, bag, the body came within a, a sealed body bag. Um, and it's sealed uh, because we're going to preserve evidence. It's just a way of us um, feeling confident that nobody's gotten into the bag or something's happened. So that's for evidence preservation. So we, we broke the seal on the bag and opened that bag up. And then we, uh, the body was further uh, enclosed within a black plastic tarp that was held together with multiple strips of duct tape. Um, and then we opened that up, and that was the first time that you could actually see the body. Um, right, right from the beginning, um, 
there were some things that obviously jumped out. Uh, one, there was a, a, plast a white plastic bag over JJ's head, and it was uh, wrapped around the face multiple times with duct tape all the way down to the neck. Um, in addition, uh, the forearms and the hands were bound with duct tape, and the ankles were bound with duct tape. Uh, JJ was wearing red pajama tops, uh, red pajama bottoms, and black socks. Um, another thing that was quite obvious is the body was in a state of decomposition. Um, there was decomposition fluid and dirt and mold on the pajama uh, tops and bottoms. Um, you could you could tell even with the clothing on. Um, that the body was in a state of decomposition by the color of the skin. And at that point, uh, we essentially took photographs, documented how the body was received, uh, and then we proceeded. Okay. Um, so you mentioned you took photographs and documented how the body was received. Uh, did you then conduct an external examination? Yes. Uh, what steps did you take in your external examination? So for the external examination, I guess backing up a little bit, um, with everything that was on the body, the clothing, the duct tape, the bag over the head, um, at that point, w we started gathering our evidence. Um, so what we did is we took the pajama tops and bottoms off, and we uh, submitted that to law enforcement. We submitted the socks to law enforcement. Uh, the bag over the head with the duct tape, uh, we made a single cut, removed it carefully, and we submitted that to law enforcement. Uh, with the duct tape around the arms, we made a single cut, unfolded that carefully, submitted that to law enforcement, and we also submitted the duct tape around the ankles. In addition to that evidence, we also did fingernail swabs uh, for evidence. We did hand swabs. Uh, the fingernails actually were uh, easily came off because of the state of decomposition, so we ended up just submitting all of the nails uh, for evidence. Um, and then in addition to that, we, we took pulled head hair, uh, a, a portion of the rib, and that was actually done during the autopsy, and two molars uh, from JJ for DNA purposes. Bone, uh, the ribs, and the molars are a good source of DNA, and we, we kind of figured that DNA may be important in this case. Uh, so that was all the evidence that, that we got and submitted to law enforcement. And then as far as the external examination goes, like I said before, uh, I do an examination from, from head to toe. Uh, and as I stated before, one thing that was obvious was the body was in the state of decomposition. The head took on a green discoloration, neck. Um, other parts of the body had a light brown, leathery appearance. Um, that is consistent with decomposition. Uh, there, there's fairly extensive skin slippage uh, throughout the body. Uh, including partial degloving or skin falling off of the hands and the feet. And that was um, essentially what I found. Uh, I also found some injuries um, that jumped out. Um, one injury was a scratch. Uh, appeared to be, there were abrasions, it appeared to be scratch-like abrasions on the left side of the neck. Um, and and Doctor, if I can ask you, why was that significant to you? Uh, that was significant to me um, in, in a case like this, uh, considering the way he was found, um, if there's any kind of injuries to the neck, um, you know, it's, it's a it's a it's a red flag. Uh, do I know exactly what it means? Uh, no, but I think some of the things that come to mind are, you know, did you know was JJ trying to get the bag off his head, and could they be scratch marks trying to get the bag off of his head? 
Um, you know, I, again, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly what happened, but those are the types of things that go through my my head. Um, there are additional injuries, including bruising of both upper arms, symmetrical bruising on the right upper arm and left upper arm. And there's also a uh, diffuse hemorrhage on the underlying the right thumbnail. There, there were also other areas that were uh, concerning or suspicious for injuries uh, that looked like bruising. Uh, it, there were areas on the ankles that looked like bruising that may have been associated with the duct tape. So when I looked at it grossly, um, it, they looked like bruises. But in all the injuries I described on the, the arm, the leg, the ankles, uh, what you do in a case like this where there's significant decomposition is sometimes decomposition can, can make things look like a bruise when it's not a bruise. Uh, so we, we took incisions on the body in multiple areas that were concerning for bruising. Um, the two areas that did show at least convincing hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissue underlying the skin were on both upper arms. Uh, the bruising on the legs or on the ankles didn't uh, show significant bruising or show bruising in the subcutaneous tissue. Um, so to me that means that it, it could have been a bruise, but I, I can't confidently say that it was. Yeah, so, Doctor, you uh, when you mentioned the hemorrhaging below the subcutaneous, did I say that correctly? Yes. Uh, layer, uh, was, to you, was that confirmation of bruising on the arms? Yes. Uh, was there, uh, what did you find in the toxicology report? So, uh, in the toxicology report, there were uh, low levels of ethanol, so alcohol. Uh, there was um, a substance or a drug called uh, GHB, gamma hydroxy butyric acid. Um, there was also a substance called theobromine, and, and I believe there's also caffeine. Um, do you know what theobromine is? Theobromine is, it can be found in cocoa and uh, tea products. And GHB, uh, what is that? So GHB, uh, gamma hydroxy butyric acid, it, it's a, a drug, or one, it can be a drug, and it can be used for medicinal purposes or recreationally. Uh, for medicinal purposes, sometimes it can be used for narcolepsy. I think at one point in time it was used as a possible anesthetic um, f or for anesthesiology. Uh, recreationally, um, it's often referred to as liquid ecstasy. Um, some refer it to as a date rate drug. Um, so it, what it does, it acts as a uh, depressant on the central nervous system. It, it can give you a sense of euphoria. Uh, it can give you a sense of calming, relaxation. It can increase libido. Uh, it can cause amnesia as well, uh, which essentially would be loss of memory during the time that you have the substance is on board. Um, so recreationally, it can be used for all of those things. Um, and in addition, GHB is naturally found in the human body. It is predominantly in the central nervous system. And again, like I stated, it acts as a depressant. And it also can be found in lower amounts in the peripheral tissues. Okay. And were the amounts of GHB, uh, how would you characterize the amount of GHB found in J.J. Vallow? The best way to uh, describe it is inconclusive. Uh, so GHB was found. So we know through literature the medical literature that GHB can be found in tissues, including liver, uh, post-mortem. Um, so it, th there's really n no way for me to tell for sure whether this is just a naturally occurring product in the body that was there 
or if JJ was given GHB. It's I, I can't say one way or the other based on the levels. So you can see here the deceit is within that black body bag. So I guess at this point we actually haven't submitted as evidence yet. Uh, but this is when we opened up that that black bag with uh, the duct tape, and this is the first view of uh, JJ, uh, the deceit. You can see, you can't see it real well on this photograph, but there is a white plastic bag uh, over the head, and it's wrapped multiple times with duct tape. In addition, you can see JJ is clothed in a red pajama top uh, that's partially soaked with decomposition fluid. And you can also see that the forearms and the wrists and the hands are tightly bound with, with duct tape as well. Can you describe what you witnessed in States Exhibit 176F? This is a photograph of the lower body now. You can see there's a blue and white blanket that partially covers the lower extremities. Uh, you can also see that JJ is wearing a red pajama bottom um, and black ankle high socks. And then you can also see the duct tape. Uh, the ankles are bound with duct tape as well. So this is a photograph with the blanket removed. You can better see uh, what JJ is uh, wearing. And you can also see the extent of the uh, decomposition fluid uh, on the clothing better uh, as well as you can see a portion, a small portion of his arm, his left upper arm and you can see it's in a state of decomposition. It's got a kind of a tan leathery appearance with skin slippage which is consistent with decomposition. Again the lower half with the blanket removed you can see the ankles are bound uh, with duct tape. So as I mentioned, uh, at this point we're gathering evidence. Uh, so at this point we made a single cut along the left side of the head to remove the white plastic bag and the surrounding duct tape. Uh, and we reflected it and you can see uh, JJ, a portion of JJ's face at least and you can see that there's a strip of duct tape covering JJ's mouth that's essentially running from jawline to jawline. So we carefully removed the plastic bag and the duct tape from JJ's head and we that's that's a view on the inside. Um, so that would have been where JJ's face was and you can see there is there is some fluid and there is some um, tissue, decomposed tissue, and that fluid is, uh, I interpret it as being decomposition fluid. It's, it's common to get decomposition fluid or purge fluid um, after somebody dies, especially when they're going through the decomposition process. So my interpretation was this was some sloughed off skin from JJ's face and decomposition fluid or purge fluid. So this is the, a photograph with the bag uh, with duct tape removed, better showing uh, the strip of duct tape covering JJ's mouth. Uh, you can also see that JJ's face is in a state of decomposition. It's diffusely, has a diffuse green discoloration and there is skin slippage predominantly near the forehead and you can also see his hair. So this is the strip of duct tape covering uh, the decedent's mouth and we submitted this to law enforcement as evidence. Yes, yeah, so I was with the, the bag and the duct tape over the head. The decision was made to make a, a single cut uh, across and reflect the duct tape binding the forms and wrists and hands so that is a photo after the single cut is made and it's reflected. And you can see JJ's hands. Uh, you can see that his wrists are further bound with duct tape, additional duct tape. And you can see on the inside of the large piece of duct tape, uh, there's decomposition 
uh, changes in fluid similar to the bag over the head. When you reviewed that, how, how specifically was that wrapped around the wrist? Right, so how was it wrapped around a wrist? So it appeared that it had been wrapped around one wrist, and then the other wrist had been laid on top of it, and then that was wrapped around the other wrist separately. So they weren't wrapped together per se, but more like one was wrapped, and then the other one was wrapped. So in addition to the red pajamas and the socks, uh, JJ was wearing a diaper. Uh, this diaper, as you can see, uh, near the top of the photograph, it's still, you can see the white and the blue, the normal coloring of the diaper. Uh, in the mid portion, especially towards the bottom of the diaper, um, that, that's all decomposition fluid and probably decomposition sloughed off tissue. Yeah, so this is a photograph of JJ's arm, um, and it's highlighted with the ruler. Uh, you can see there's some discoloration. Uh, as I mentioned before, with decomposition, you can get different types of colors. Um, some of them can mimic bruising. Um, this one kind of jumped out as it looked m more than a decomposition change. It looked more like bruising. It was dark red. Um, so that's a photograph of that. So this is a photograph of that same area of what I thought to be bruising. And oftentimes what I will do and what other forensic pathologists will do in cases where uh, the body is decomposed is we'll make an incision into that bruise and we'll look for hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissue and the soft tissue. The idea being that if you do see actual hemorrhage in the subcutaneous and soft tissue that it is true and true versus the artifact of decomposition. Um, so you can see uh, this is an incision. Uh, the forceps are holding it back, reflecting it. And you can see pretty obvious hemorrhage uh, with, within the subcutaneous tissue and that yellow adipose tissue as well. Doctor, you may have already stated this, but what portion of his arm was this? So there were bruising on bilateral upper arms and they were symmetric. So this was on the right arm. Okay. So this is a photograph of JJ's neck, the left side of his neck. And you can see, if I can orient you a little better, so at the top you can see hair. So that would be hair on the left side um, of, on the left side of JJ's head. And then this is a, a photograph of the left side of his neck. So there's a couple things you can see. One, you can see a slight or faint impression of where the duct tape was around the neck. Um, and it's fairly well delineated. And then in addition, you can see multiple brown to light brown um, abrasions, uh, some with a small amount of red hemorrhage uh, that are scattered on the left side of the neck and on the left angle of the jaw. And this is a photograph of his, the left side of his neck. So again, you know, that impression, if you can appreciate that, it's very well delineated um, along the superior inferior borders. And then you have multiple uh, abrasions, these light brown to red uh, abrasions that appear most consistent with scratch-like abrasions, uh, in my experience, uh, some with hemorrhage that are on the uh, left side of the neck and the left angle of the jaw. Yes, yeah, so this is a photograph of JJ's right hand. As mentioned earlier, there was partial degloving, which essentially means there's a significant amount of skin slippage on the hands. Um, and you can see the right thumb, um, and this sticks out. Uh, all the other fingernails had a very similar appearance. Uh, 
pretty unremarkable. The right fingernail or subungual tissue underneath the fingernail, uh, there's this bright red bruising. Doctor. It essentially means that there's been trauma uh, to that area and blood vessels have been broken and it essentially has caused a bruise. This is a photograph of uh, JJ's lower leg, including a shin, left ankle, and portion of the foot. I believe I mentioned earlier that when we removed the duct tape from the ankles, it did appear that there may be some bruising that was associated with that. Uh, to the naked eye, just looking at it, it looked like bruising to me. Um, I did the same thing as I did with the arm, and I made multiple sections looking for a hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissue, and I did not see any obvious hemorrhage in that area. So what does that mean? Um, it's uh, when, you, when you did that incision and observed the lack of hemorrhaging, what did that mean to you? So it was inconclusive to me. I can't completely rule out that it's not a bruise, but I can't say that it really is. It could be part of the decomposition process. Doctor, in regards to the bruising you found on JJ's arms, are you able to make any type of determination if that is pre or post mortem? Based on my findings, I believe the bruising in the arms is anti mortem. When you say anti mortem, is that before? Yes, before death. Okay. And uh, what leads you to believe that? Well, essentially, um, because, well, one, they looked like bruises when you just looked at them. And then, two, when I made the incisions and there was hemorrhage um, in the soft tissues and subcutaneous tissue, um, it, it definitely uh, suggests that it was anti-mortem. Uh, when somebody dies, um, there's no longer circulation. Um, so if, for instance, somebody's picked up after they're dead by the arms, you wouldn't expect uh, bruising, especially in this subcutaneous tissue like you saw in that case, in this case. And then in the area of the neck where you described uh, the abrasions, I believe, at, could those abrasions just be decomposition? I don't believe so. Uh, the reason being is they look like abrasions. Um, they oftentimes abrasions that are post-mortem take on a certain look to them. Uh, they will have a yellow appearance. Um, they'll have a very waxy appearance to them, They're very firm. And there's rarely or if ever any hemorrhage associated with them. Uh, the abrasions on the neck in this particular case on JJ's neck, uh, they had more of a, a tan brown to red appearance, and there was hemorrhage associated with them. So that makes me believe that those are also anti-mortem as well. Doctor, were you involved in an autopsy of Tylee Ryan? Yes. Uh, so this autopsy was different. Um, the vast majority of the times when I perform an autopsy, uh, I get an entire body, and there's a very, there's a process that we went through, like with JJ, that I go through. Tylee's case was different. It was received by me in, or Tylee's remains were received in three separate sealed bags. Um, one of the bags, or two of the bags, were black body bags. And the third was a large brown paper bag uh, that was sealed, and within that contained five other paper bags within it. Um, so I received, essentially I received Tylee's remains in multiple different bags. That autopsy lasted, um, it was much longer uh, because of the process of uh, sifting through the remains, trying to identify bones, soft tissue, uh, multiple x-rays, cleaning the bones, getting them ready for anthropology. Um, it, it took on the order of several days, but probably about a week.
Based on the remains you received, were you able to do any types of toxicology? Yes. Uh, how, how were you able to do that? So in this case, um, with the remains, uh, there was no blood to send, there was no urine, no vitreous fluid. So one sample that can be used for toxicology is skeletal muscle. In this particular case, there were um, large pieces of identifiable skeletal muscle. Uh, so I cut into the skeletal muscle and I got the, the best tissue that I could and then we send that for toxicology. What were the results of that? So I believe uh, it came back positive for ibuprofen. It came back for a common decompositional product that we see in most cases of decomposition. Uh, it came back with uh, a carbon monoxide level, uh, a carboxyhemoglobin saturation level, and also oh, sorry, a carboxyhemoglobin saturation level, and also iron. So just to explain the iron, carboxyhemoglobin, those. Um, so any kind, of, any kind of fire death, in this case we knew we were dealing with uh, burnt remains, um, we, we tested for carboxyhemoglobin. So carboxyhemoglobin um, or carbon monoxide in fire is often released um, along with multiple other gases. And if that is breathed in and the person is alive, then you'll get a high carboxyhemoglobin saturation level. So that's why we even did that test. In, the, in this particular uh, case, the carboxyhema, uh, or the c carbon monoxide level came back extremely low, um, meaning that there was, th there's no evidence to support that Ty Lee was alive when she was burned. Uh, skeletal muscle is not the best sample to test for that, blood is, but skeletal could give you a, a, an idea. So amongst the debris of the dismembered body, we were able to find, uh, I was able to find the heart. I was able to find, and it was actually connected still to the right and the left lung. Um, I was able to find one kidney. Um, I was able to find a few small segments of bowel. I was able to find portions of a liver and also there were very small fragments of brain matter. Now with, with that being said, um, this, this was not like in JJ's where the organs were very still intact and easily identifiable. Uh, these organs had severe decomposition. Um, they had significant burning artifact. They were charred, they were shrunken, but those were the organs that I, I found. And presumably the rest of the organs either burned away um, or just were never found. Uh, so in one of the large bags, there was essentially the pelvis with portions of the, at least first portion of the femur that were attached to them. So your right pelvis, left pelvis, sacrum, and then portions, small portions of the femur. In one of the other large bags, uh, we were able to find portions of the skull, including the uh, superior portion of the orbit, eyeball would be, other fragments of the skull, fragments of the mandible and maxilla uh, with some teeth still intact. Uh, there were more, multiple vertebral uh, bodies from your vertebral column uh, that were identified, uh, both clavicles, uh, there were multiple long bones, including tibia and fibula from your lower leg, uh, the radius and ulna from your forearm, a uh, portion of the sternum uh, was identified, multiple rib fragments uh, were identified. Um, and I think those were the, the main bones that were found. And again, these weren't nice, clean bones. These were bones that had significant artifact secondary to uh, the fire. Okay. So when you say significant artifact, does that mean effects of the fire? Yes, they're, they're blackened and charred uh, and also 
um, it was presumed that some of it, some of it, the artifact was due to the dismembering process as well. Dr. Warren, based on your autopsy of Tyree Ryan and based upon your education, training, and experience, have you formed an expert opinion concerning the cause of death of Tyree Ryan? Yes. What is that cause of death? I determined the cause of death to be homicide by unspecified means. Homicide by unspecified means, does that have a uh, specific definition? It does. So homicide by unspecified means uh, is a term that is or can be used for the cause of death uh, when the forensic pathologist has essentially looked at the totality of the case, including the circumstances of the death, uh, the autopsy findings and lack thereof autopsy findings in this case, uh, the toxicology, and also uh, based on medical and social records that the forensic pathologist, which is me in this case, feels that the, the cause of death was by homicide, but I just can't pinpoint exactly what that was. Most homicides, you can say something like gunshot wound to the head the body's intact, or a stab wound to the heart. I can't do that in this case. And we're back with a quick little outfit change. So after this, Lori's attorney, John Thomas, did the most idiotic cross-examination, in my opinion, of all time. And the witness got a little feisty. So take a listen. Um, so you indicated the cause of death on JJ was, well, I don't want to get this wrong, Why don't you go ahead and tell me what it was? It was asphyxia by plastic bag over the head and duct tape covering the mouth. Right. Plastic bag over the head. So tell me what evidence um, did you collect? Did you collect any evidence um, inside the sinuses? Did you swab the sinuses and pull out any evidence? No. Okay. Did you um, swab the throat or go down the throat somehow and swab anything down there? Yes, we took oral swabs. Okay. And did you find any evidence of uh, microplastics or something that might be consistent with someone being smothered with a plastic bag? Well, I wouldn't expect to find that, but no, we didn't find anything. Okay. So how is it that you're coming to the conclusion that this person was smothered with a plastic bag? Right. So... Um, going back, so J.J. was found with a plastic bag over his head um, that was duct taped tightly. He was bound. There was evidence of a struggle, and there was no other explanation of why he was dead. So it was a rule out. I wouldn't consider a rule out because there's a plastic bag over his head. Okay, but that plastic bag could have been put over his head post-mortem, right? I guess that's possible. Okay. But you're saying that your conclusion is, is that it was done anti-mortem prior Correct. to his death. Correct. And that's based on n nothing concrete, just your theory of the way you think the crime may have happened. No. I think essentially that's how an autopsy um, and all the tests, um, that's why you do all of those things. So you have a person with a plastic bag over their head and is bound and you do all the tests and you do the autopsy and you find zero reason for them to be dead, then it's reasonable to conclude that that was the cause of death. Okay, but you, let's, let's back up a little bit. When I talked about swabbing the sinuses or swabbing the nasal cavity, you didn't do that? I've never heard anybody doing that in this type of situation. Okay, what type of situation are you talking about? Uh, bag over the head. Okay, so when someone has a bag over their head, and they are, and I'm just going off of things I've seen in movies and whatnot. It seems That's like. scary. That's scary to you? Yeah, that you're going off movies. Okay. So, well, you're going off of, uh, off of. My knowledge. Knowledge, okay. So when someone puts a bag over their head and they're trying to breathe in air, is that correct? What, yes. When, how this happens? Yes. Okay. Does, does. 
Next, Dr. Angie Christensen took the stand. She is a forensic anthropologist for the FBI in Quantico, Virginia. She examined Tylee's bones. In addition to the bones being fragmented and charred, she indicated that three bones had sharp edges that were likely impacted by some sort of tool. She also said that at least one bone was bent and one had signs of a mammal chewing on it. Overall, her assessment of Tylee's bones, in addition to thermal damage, she noted signs of blunt trauma, sharp force trauma, and high-velocity trauma. The sharp force trauma was on three bones, left and right hip bones and the back of her pelvis. The prosecution showed photos of the bones where the sharp impact points could be seen. Dr. Christensen said that she had a lot of experience in examining and accessing remains that are dismembered, and interestingly, she said that the sharp trauma in those types of cases usually appear around the joints, and this was not the case for Tylee's bones. Dr. Christensen continued on Thursday morning with her testimony, and I'll be honest, what we're about to get into is extremely troubling and disturbing. She continued to explain that the sharp force trauma on the bones of Tylee's remains was not consistent with typical dismemberment. Tylee had different areas of trauma on the right hip bone, and her sacrum was still attached to the lumbar vertebrae and had one sharp force indicator on the left side of the sacrum. After that, Douglas Hale Pasca from the FBI Laboratory Division in Virginia as a forensic examiner in the Firearms and Tools Marks Division took the stand. He determined that Tylee's bones showed trauma and cuts from stabbing and chopping actions. He conducted numerous tests in the lab but was unable to conclude exactly what tool did this. But he also said he never tested the tools that were seized from Chad's shed. So that was a little weird. And Lori's attorney kept trying to hammer that point. However, he said that based on his experience, most likely the tools used were a cleaver, machete, or hatchet. There were also some indications that some of the tools would have had serrated edges. The pubic bone area was severely damaged with extreme signs of stabbing and chopping actions. Additionally, from where the sacrum was damaged, some of the bone trauma indicated that it was stabbed or chopped from the backside, or where a butt would be. So, if you're like me, you probably need a second to process all of that. So let's stop for a second here. I don't know exactly what they were trying to say here, but if all of these injuries were not from dismemberment, something even sicker than I imagined happened to poor Tylee. If she had already passed when this happened, and the dismemberment was going to take place at some point, there would be no reason for someone to do this. So that tells me that this was intentional. This was overkill. This is someone with extreme anger issues, or I don't even know what issues, to be honest, because this is truly demented and sick. It hasn't been said when these injuries occurred, and if Tylee's body was still intact or if they occurred post-mortem or not. According to my court insider, jurors looked horrified learning how Tylee was stabbed and chopped at. Photos of bones with marks were shown to the jury and to the court. Lori was seen swaying back and forth slightly in her seat whenever the witness was guessing the tool that was used on Tylee. Next, there were several witnesses with shorter testimony throughout the day. In summary, it was confirmed that gasoline was used as an accelerant to burn Tylee's remains. DNA from tools seized from Chad's shed only had Tylee's DNA and a lot of her DNA on the tools, including the pickaxe and shovel, but it didn't have any of Chad, Lori's, or Alex's DNA. However, there were two latent fingerprints found on the duct tape collected from JJ that did match Alex. My court insider said, when it was revealed that one article of evidence had a latent fingerprint, the whole room got silent. It felt like the room had all of the air sucked out. Lori kept her head down. Several members of the jury had stunned looks on their faces. The judge decided that that would be a good time to break. Some jurors also kept their eyes on Lori as they exited for the break. At this point, Lori had her chair turned and was kind of lowering herself to shrink even further down into the chair, apparently. Next on the stand was Tammy's sister, Samantha. 
She was only on the stand for a few minutes on Thursday before court ended, and she started again on the stand on Friday morning. Tammy's family has remained pretty silent this whole time, and I can't even begin to fathom the pain and anger that they must feel for Tammy's death. And then, knowing the betrayal, the affair, the lies, all of it. Are you related to Tammy Daybell? Yes, I am. She's my sister. Did Tammy love animals? She did. Do you know if she loved him her whole life? Uh, yeah, we always had pets. Uh, guinea pigs, she had ducks. Um, like the whole gamut, we had all of them. Did animals seem to love Tammy? Yeah, she was a person that was, you know, they were just drawn to her and she loved taking care of them. Was that the same way with people? Yeah, she was a little bit of an introvert, but she loved people and loved taking care of them. She loved her grandkids. Do you recognize that photo? Yes, I do. And who is that? It's my sister. How many children are in your family? Uh, there's five of us kids. Where did Tammy fit in that line? She was the second oldest. And how many brothers? We have three brothers. And you and Tammy were the only girls? Yeah, we were the only sisters. Were you close growing up? Yes, they were only four years apart, and so we were far enough apart we didn't fight and close enough together that we got along really well. <laughs> and did you maintain that closeness as you entered into adulthood? Uh, yes, we uh, talked every day and saw each other every day and we did um, everything together with our children. And do you recall when Tammy started dating Chad Daybell? Yeah, I do. Did you know him from before? Uh, yes, his family lives in our hometown, and so I went to school with his brothers. Um, he was older than me. He was the same age as my oldest brother, so he was not one that I hung around with, but I knew him. Did you like Chad when she started dating him? Yeah, he was a really nice guy. Did you feel like he treated Tammy well? Yeah, he did. And then they ultimately ended up married? Yeah. And throughout their marriage, did you feel, did you maintain contact with Chad and Tammy? Yes, we were very close. Was Chad, in fact, friends with your husband? Yes. Prior to Tammy moving to Idaho, how close did she live to you? We were two blocks away from each other. How often did you see her? Every day. Do you know how many kids Tammy and Chad have together? Yeah, five. And you mentioned earlier Tammy's also a grandmother? Yes. Did Tammy want to move to Idaho? Um, at first, no. Uh, she doesn't like change. And all of her family was there so uh, in, in Springville. So it was uh, not something she wanted to do at first. Do you know whose idea it was for them to move? It was Chad's. Did Tammy work prior to moving to Idaho? Yes, she did. What did she do for work? Um, at the time that they moved, she was the special ed secretary at the high school. And previous to that, she worked at the elementary school as the computer teacher. Was she good with computers? Oh, she was amazing with them. She was the go-to person? She was the go-to person if any of us had a question about something that she could answer it, and she would pick up any new software and could figure it out. Uh, she was self-taught and was very smart. And the two jobs you mentioned, she worked closely with children? Yes, she did. When they first got married, do you know what Chad did for work? Um, he was working for the Springville City Cemetery um, for the Parks Department. He was uh, part of the cemetery upkeep crew. They helped prepare um, all the graves, and they took care of the cemetery you know, upkeep. Was he also involved in ever digging graves that you know of? Uh, yeah, that was part of their job, is that they would dig all the graves that came through for any of the burials at the cemetery. Eventually, um, he came back and was the sexton at that cemetery, at that Springville, uh, it was at the Evergreen Cemetery in Springville. And then eventually he was the sexton at the Spanish Fork Cemetery. How did you find out about your sister's passing? Chad called me the morning that she passed away. Do you recall what he told you? Um, he told me that she had been really sick 
and that um, she had been coughing all night, and um, she gone, had gotten up and with a coughing fit around midnight, one o'clock, and had gone back to sleep. And he was awakened by her that morning when she rolled out of bed dead. Did that make any sense to you? No, because I had just seen her two weeks previous to that, and she hadn't been that. She wasn't that sick at all. She was very healthy. Did she indicate to you any activities that she was participating in? <laughs> yeah, uh, she was in a clogging class, and she was showing us um, some of her clogging moves. But she was also preparing to run, um, a, you know, smaller race in their town. So she was trying to stay fit uh, and healthy. And how old was she? She wasn't 50 yet. We were going to get ready to celebrate her 50th birthday. When she came to visit in October, was that a normal visit? No, it was out of the blue. Did anyone come with her? No, she came by herself, and that was unusual because Tammy didn't like to travel alone. Did she tell you why she came down to visit? Um, Chad told her that she needed to come visit her family. After Tammy's death, Chad planned the funeral, but Samantha immediately noticed something was off. Not only did Tammy's death not make sense, but the gathering for Tammy was so small, and Chad kind of brushed it off as like, oh, I don't want to make it a big fuss and not a big deal kind of thing. Samantha asked Chad why he was burying her in Springville, Utah instead of Rexburg, and Chad said that Rexburg was too cold and she'd be under ice and snow, and that they wouldn't be able to visit her that often. Many family members weren't able to go to Tammy's funeral because it was so fast. Chad's son, Mark, was in Africa at the time. Others were out of the country. Two weeks after Tammy's funeral, Samantha and her family found out that Chad was remarried, and the entire family was devastated and had trouble even wrapping their minds around the fact that he got married in the first place. Chad wouldn't even tell Tammy's side of the family that he had gotten remarried. He made one of his daughters call Tammy's mother. What a freaking coward. Chad told Tammy's family that his new wife was named Lori Ryan and that her recent husband died of a heart attack, which, what's going on here? Everybody's got a different story as to how Charles died. First, it was self-defense. Then it was he took his own life. Then it was a heart attack. Like, even if you're going to lie, fine, but commit to the lie. Make up one singular lie. Nobody seems to be able to, like, manage to do that, and they're all telling different stories here, which, in my opinion, you're more likely to get busted and caught, but... Chad Dumball doesn't seem very smart anyway. So Samantha wanted to figure out who Lori Ryan was and immediately boo -doo -doo -doo, went to Google, of course, to try to search for her. And when she did, she found out about Charles being shot and saw his obituary, which mentioned that Lori would be taking care of JJ. Just saw all of it, pretty much. And more importantly, she saw that her name definitely was not Lori Ryan and that there was no heart attack. So she called Chad and confronted him, and Chad's response was that Lori had a hard life and that he was avoiding telling Samantha about this because Lori just really wanted to move on. And then get this, a bombshell. Samantha asked, are there children? Are you going to be raising children with her? And Chad responded, no, there are no children, and we are going to be empty nesters. Chad also told Samantha that Lori had a lot of money. After Samantha's testimony, witnesses from the Rexburg police were called to testify about the shooting attempt on Tammy. Because if you remember, this was the same night that Lori was overheard talking like she was super pissed off and said, uh, idiot, he can't do anything right, believed to be about Alex Cox, her henchman. Tammy's 911 call to the police was then played in court. Okay, go ahead. What's the address? Okay, um, at 202 North, 1900 East. Sorry, this is a little awkward. And Debbie, did you recognize your voice? The corner with the blinking yellow light on Highway. Is it a suspicious person? Yes. Okay, what was he wearing? He was all dressed in black and he had a ski mask on. And he said the blinking light now is where you saw him? No, no, I'm, when I, he's gone now, because um, I pulled up into our driveway, and he 
I didn't step out of the back seat of my car, and suddenly he was there, and he had a paintball gun, and he was okay, okay. and like he was going to shoot at me. And I kept asking him what he was doing because I could tell it was a paintball thing. And then he just kept doing it, so I yelled to my husband, and then he took off running around the back of my house. Okay, give me just one minute. Stay on the line with me. Okay. October 9, 2019. 21 hours, 50 minutes, 28 seconds. That was North 1900 East. Yes. October 9, 2019. 21 hours, 50 minutes, 43 seconds. In what uh, direction he was going? Um... He just he went behind my house and it's so dark out here and I just went in the house and got my husband and son and then they went out and looked and he was long gone by then. So he was on the north side of my house is where he went to get away. Okay. He didn't say anything or he just kept at like he was holding the gun like he was, you know, had a rifle and just shooting at me, so. But nothing came out of the gun either, so I don't think it was loaded. Okay, and what is your name? Just, my name is Tammy Daybell. Okay, I will pass your information on to my deputies. Um, we actually just had a previous call about this individual, so they're out in the area looking now. Okay, yeah, I think it was my son-in-law who lives diagonal from us that called you guys already. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So I wanted to make sure it got reported. So, um, let's see. And what's your son-in-law's name? Is it? Joseph Murray. Okay, yep, it was him. Okay. So, all right, I have a deputy that will be out at your home here shortly. The 911 call after Tammy's death was also played, and you can hear Chad on the phone. Now, when this was played, Lori was smirking in court. When the Rexburg police arrived on the scene, Garth and Chad were in the living room. Chad was distraught and crying, apparently. Chad said that Tammy woke up at midnight with a coughing fit and then vomited, and then he came to the bathroom and helped her. They both went back to sleep, and then around 5.40 a.m., he heard Tammy roll off the bed. Chad asked her to get up, but when she didn't respond, he turned on the light and realized that she was only partially off the bed, so he put her back in bed. Now, we know at this point that this story never happened since her cause of death was ruled as asphyxiation, but that is just an idiotic story to even tell, and it doesn't even make any sense. 
Remember from earlier testimony, the night before was the day that Chad and Lori were on a call for almost one hour around 11 p.m. Chad said that Tammy didn't like to go to the doctor, but had some blood pressure issues. And the entire time, Chad's son Garth was right there as Chad was saying this, and Garth never interrupted to say, no, that's not true, or anything like that. Pictures of Tammy at the scene were shown, and in the pictures, Tammy was on the bed with a blue comforter with pink foam in her mouth. Now, I want to pause for a second here and bring up that whenever Chad told Tammy's sister that he didn't want to bury Tammy in Rexburg because it was too cold and she would be under ice and snow, why wouldn't Rexburg be too cold for Tylee and JJ? And also, since Tammy was possessed by a demon named Viola and a zombie, the only way to get rid of demons was by destroying the body or being bound. So why wasn't Tammy disposed of in the same way that JJ and Tylee were? We know that Lori doesn't think that the rules apply to herself and constantly changes the rules to suit her, but we also know that Chad was calling the shots here and decided who was and wasn't a zombie, who wasn't the one who had a dark spirit or not, and he was the one that came up with all of this crap to begin with. So my question is, why on earth would Chad make all of that up for Lori's children, but not for his wife or any of his own children? Is there something under the surface there, or is there a deeper meaning behind it? Or is he just simply a wicked, evil, manipulative loser who, as Colby so eloquently said, Peter Griffin look-alike with a god complex? The next witness was Cammy Wilmore, who was a deputy coroner for Fremont County who went out to Chad's house when Tammy died. Chad told her that at midnight she got sick and that Tammy likes to sleep with one leg outside of the bed because of menopause. And Chad originally thought that maybe her leg fell off the bed and that that was the noise that he heard. She was really confused by the pink foam in Tammy's mouth and also felt that rigor mortis had set in well before she arrived. Then the actual county coroner arrived. Chad also said that Tammy had low blood pressure and fainting spells and wasn't doing well the past few weeks. He didn't say anything about fainting spells to the officers when they first arrived, though. The next witness was the county coroner, who arrived after the deputy coroner, Brenda Dye. She said that she saw a bruise on her arm and blood pooling on her back. Brenda asked how Tammy could have fallen off the bed if she was dead. That she must have moved and then she fell, which I don't really think that that answered her question. There was also a kitchen towel near Tammy that Chad said he had been using to wipe Tammy's mouth because of the pink foaming, but every time he did that, more foam would come out. Brenda grabbed the towel and wiped Tammy's mouth, and it did the same thing. Foam came out afterward, which didn't make sense, and she said she had never seen that before. Chad told Brenda that Tammy typically treated everything with natural medicine. Now, what's interesting is that Chad and Garth both say they saw her throwing up. This is pretty interesting because the story of how Tammy died has constantly changed since it happened, and Chad has told numerous conflicting stories to people. Afterward, Chad, of course, did not request an autopsy, and Tammy's death was ruled as natural by pulmonary endema with seizure-like activity. Which, how exactly they knew that without an autopsy? Your guess is as good as mine. The next witness called is Spencer Cook, the technology director for the school district that Tammy worked at. Their network server has access to an archive of all emails. He was asked by Fremont County to look through Tammy's email to see if there was the email from Charles that he sent right before he was killed in July of 2019. Tammy was extremely active in her emails, even though it was summertime. When he reviewed the email activity for June 29th, 2019, the day that Charles sent Tammy the email with the subject, your husband and my wife, there were several emails deleted and one saved. The email that Charles sent was deleted and his email address was blocked in her email. His email was the only email listed in Tammy's account under the blocked section. So did she read it? I guess there's a chance that she just deleted it without opening it, but I would absolutely click on an email with that subject. I think most people would do the same. Combining that with the fact that she went out of her way to block that email makes me believe that she did read it or maybe that Chad intercepted it and so he blocked Charles to make sure he couldn't get any future emails and then that was the day he had to die because he was like in, in inserting himself into he and Tammy's marriage. But that's all the technology director said before being released from the witness stand. So did she read it or not? Let me know what you guys think. 
So that's basically where we wrapped up for this week of the Lori Vallow trial. Now, here we go. I have some exciting information to share to you. Well, exciting, yes. I don't know for you. You tell me. I'm doing these recaps, obviously, week to week. There is a court insider who we have been communicating with who has been giving us real-time updates. However, as of last night, we made the official decision. We are sending a member from the 10 to Life team to the courthouse, to the courtroom, who will be there firsthand watching this all go down and bringing you the updates. So those updates are going to actually be posted. I don't do Twitter. I just don't really know how. So what we're going to do is we are going to be providing you real-time updates all next week with um, the highlights through my Instagram stories. So instead of a tweet, it'll just go on my Instagram story after one after another throughout the day every day. So if you're not following along there, make sure you do so. It's at underscore Annie Elise and those updates will go out literally a bunch a day as if it's a Twitter feed. And then I, of course, will still come on at the end of the week and give you the full comprehensive overview of the week in case you didn't get a chance to see those stories in real time where we'll recap the trial, of course, week to week. So that's all I got for you today. That's where we're at with Looney Tune Ballow. And um, this woman is just a monster. I hope she rots. I hope she her defense crumbles. I hope nobody believes it. I hope she can't pull the brainwash card. This woman is truly a monster and the most evil mother in the world. And after hearing these horrific, horrific new details about Tylee and JJ, what human being could do that, let alone a mother to her own children? It is sick. And then you layer on top of that that she's just sitting there in the courtroom smirking with her dumb face thinking she's a pageant star it is sick vile twisted disgusting i hate her i'm getting rowdy because it's friday and i've got a lot of thoughts i've got a lot of feelings <laughs> all right guys thanks so much for tuning in i will keep you guys posted as this trial and circus freak show continues to unravel and make sure that you check out instagram all next week because our attend to life reporter researcher extraordinaire will be there in the courthouse documenting everything in real time. All right, guys, thanks again. And until the next one, stay safe. Bye.